Hello, this is Joe McGee. You know, we've been doing seminars across the country for years. Seminars on marriage, parenting, men, money, and family. We want to encourage you to email us and let us know if this podcast has helped you. Or maybe you have joined us live at one of our seminars. If you have a testimony, you just want to tell us what God's doing in your life, please email us at mail at joemcgeeministries.com or you can contact us through our website, joemcgeeministries.com. There you will find helpful articles and tools to help you grow in God, your marriage, and your family. We love you guys. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, everybody. It's Joe and Angel. We're here with another Mailbag Monday. Angel, we've got a lot of letters that have come in, so let's jump right into this. And I am Angel Joe's wife. You are Angel, my <laughs> wife. Yes, you are. You're not just a lady that we got off the street. To, hey, we should not come help us out in here. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, we're two deep water people. Yes. Okay. Veterans. We're veterans. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, Joe, it feels like my wife's tolerance for me has faded. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the crab, son. Hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I think it's mutual. It feels the longer we're married, the more I expect things will always work out. So I am more vocal and I put up with less. I'm not saying it's right, but is it typical? That as you get older, or the longer you're in a relationship, this happens. Sure, sure, uh, happens with everybody and everything. Uh, I go to Revelation where uh, Jesus, you know, the angels talking to uh, you. Got the seven churches and the seven angels, and uh, and he's talking to the church at Ephesus, and he's bragging on Ephesus more than any of the other six churches. Ephesus doing the most, sacrificed the most, gave the most, and he's bragging on them. And all of a sudden, he said, "But I have this one thing against you." And they said, I thought you liked this. I do. I'm proud of it. I just listed all the stuff I'm proud of. But I have this one thing against you. And they said, what? You have left your first love. Mm. They said, what? Yeah, you've left your first love. And I said, I said are you kidding? He said, no. I've not heard from you in a while. You, I blessed you and you're doing good, but you, you don't talk to me. You know, talked to a few weeks ago. You know, got up early and said hello. But you're just all on your own right now. So you don't ever come visit with me. That's why God created humans to visit, hang out with. He likes to visit with us. And so you need to remember from which you've fallen, repent that you fell, and redo what you did in the beginning. Remember that where you were. You, you got, so I, I did a couple one time, uh, uh, church says that, I think in Kentucky, and a guy came up and says, yeah, that was great today, Mr. McGee. Uh, he said, you know, I, I, I fall in love with my wife about six or seven times a year. Mm. And uh, I think they've been married 30-something years. So what? Yeah, I fall in love with my wife about six or seven times a year. And we realize we get so busy paying bills and kids and going to ball games or whatever. We get busy and we just don't take time for each other. We're married. We sleep in the same bed. We eat at uh-huh. the same table. You know, we drive the same car sometimes, but we don't talk. Mm. And so I have, remember I've got to date my wife. So I, I start dating my wife six, seven times a year all over again and take her on a date, maybe go for a cup of coffee and fall in love again. So same thing with the church at Ephesus. Everybody falls out of love. You go through it. I tell people, you take a lot of take a lot of pictures on your wedding day because it goes downhill from there. <laughs> I said, now listen, guys, you got to realize something. Uh, my in-laws were wonderful people. Married, I think I've lost count, 67 years. And he came to one of my seminars when he was 95. And my mother-in-law was 89, and they came to one of my marriage seminars in, in town where I was at. And so uh, and I thought, oh, my goodness, my father-in-law's here. And I thought, well, he's never been to one of my seminars. And I realized the last session is on sex and marriage. I thought, oh, my goodness, can I do this? Yeah, I cannot not do it. I'm, I'm, I've am I'm been brought here to teach on this. So anyhow, I'm teaching on it. And he comes up afterward, and he's. I thought, man, I hope he's not mad. And so he's shaking hands. And so he gets up to me, and he shakes my hand, and looks left and right. And, you know, and he said, you know, we still do it about twice a week. I said, please don't tell me that. I don't want to know that. <laughs> but the point was, he's 95. He's still in love with his wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're both old, wrinkled, crinkled, sagging, and dragging. But they're still in love with one another. <laughs> and that's what people don't understand because the media has messed that up. It's so much. I mean, we all had great. <laughs> we all have. Uh, at least I grew up with my dad had 12 brothers and sisters. So my father law. So we had a lot of old people that lived a long time. Mm-hmm. They still giggled and kissed one another, even with the uh, uh, snuff in their mouth. They still oh. hug and kiss. Oh, no, no, and no. It's still romantic. It's like it's it's an attitude of the heart. It, yeah. It's a heart issue. So uh, it was funny that. Uh, OK, in my mind, you know, I am a renovator. <laughs> Only in my mind. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think I could. Oh, yeah. You ever see people like flip houses and stuff? Oh, yeah. I think I could do that. Yeah. I, oh, that I could do. <laughs> I could do that. So I I like to watch those shows like uh, uh, rea- the reality ones. So there's this one show on DIY called uh, Reality Renovations. Got it. And so actually I was watching one yesterday with this couple. They'd never done anything. They bought, They decided to flip their kitchen into the living room and then their living room into the kitchen. <laughs> and so they were going to have to take out a fireplace. They were going to have to change the window sizes and everything. So they took a week off of work. <laughs> and, and, and neither, neither, <laughs> and neither one of them had ever had any experience before. So they were only like reading everything. The first day, you know, it kind of goes to it pretty fast. And I'm thinking the first couple of days, this man is patient because this woman is just like why are you doing that what are you doing that are you sure you turn the gas <laughs> off you know da, 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 da. she's just kind of going like that and i'm thinking he man he is really really patient well he got to day three where he was tired uh-huh. <laughs> and the cabinets came in and they opened the cabinets and uh there was a flaw like on one side of the cabinets and he's like it'll be fine It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And so he's starting to beef up a little bit. He's saying more. <laughs> and she is like, I don't know that it's going to be fine. I don't know that it's going to be fine. So she, you know, they get him up and she burst into tears, you know. So anyways, the, it's, and then it shows you how, the before and after and, and then like the after effects. And it says every day when she's in this kitchen, she's still reminded of the flaw in the <laughs> thing. You know? So anyway, I. I'm saying when pressure comes in, mm. sometimes you say and do things that you would not in a normal, easygoing, Ooh, perfect atmosphere yeah. do. Oh, yeah. The problem with that is once you cross that line and start saying things that you didn't say before, that's the line. Yes, it and is. so next time you'll push it further. Yes, you will. Um, like I always say, you know, if if particularly like if you're in an abusive relationship and somebody hits somebody, then you say, mm. oh, well, it won't happen again. Yes, it will, because that's where the bar has been raised. So what Joe said is true. You have to make an effort to say, this is my spouse, that I'm. these are boundaries we're not going to cross, and treat them with respect. Yes. You know, one time I heard you say, well, not only is Angel my wife, but she's my sister in the Lord, which... When you said that, I was like, huh, I never think of myself as your sister <laughs> in the Lord. <laughs> that's kind of a concept. Yeah. But reality is that's true. Yes. And so we we need to go back to the biblical way of what love does yes. and love gives. So um, if you've gone to that place where you're irritated and you're frustrated, then you need to go back and say, whoa, let's, let's, let's take a break here and, yes. and regroup. Yes. Because you're a team. And the devil's going to try to divide the team. And you cannot wait until your spouse is nice. Well, I'll be nice when you're right. nice. And I'll be kind when you're kind. I'll stop yelling when you No, you have to take the lead. I don't care what you do. I'm going to spend the rest of my life loving you whether you like it or not. I'm going to go the second mile. I'm going to give you my shirt and my coat just like Jesus taught. I'm going to do stuff that I don't want to do. I like to just scream real loud and, and throw a pie in your face. But nope, <laughs> I'm just going to be real loving. What can I do for you, sir? How can I help you? What's, what's wrong? How can I make this better? Because we're problem solvers. Jesus said, blessed are the problem solvers. They'll be called the mm-hmm. children of God. Mm-hmm. And the word there is peacemaker, but it's a problem solver. A peacemaker is a problem solver. So when you get married, you know, and I tell people all the time, when you get married, you died anyhow. Uh, Hallmark's got the cards all wrong, I should say. Because they say, congratulations, I heard you got married. It should say, I'm so sorry, I heard you got married. Because <laughs> if you don't die at that marriage seminar, you're a half-dead zombie. You, you're trying to find somebody when you get married. You want to spend the rest of your life giving your life away to. Well, and when I was first married in my 20s, mm-hmm. I definitely said more and Ooh. was more feisty and all. <laughs> Can uh, <not> imagine. <laughs> you, better, you better sweeten up now. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> deep, deep water. Uh, deep. So, but, you know, the second time around, yes. since I had a 12-year gap to think about things yes. and hopefully improve myself, you know, uh, you you uh you you learn what matters 
Well, you need bottom line. You get married. God gave you a somebody totally opposite from you, 180 degree different. And their job the rest of your life is to expose character flaws in your life. Mm-hmm. The reason you got married, you needed somebody <laughs> to expose character. And you if said, you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, <laughs> your wife will let you know. Yeah. yeah. I know. Oh, you look just like the Holy Spirit. Listen to your spouse because that is a gift from God. That's yes. what that's what God had in mind. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper. And And here's the thing. Isn't it you, if you just listen and let it stuff it down and get irritated, then it then it's going to burst out in the way yeah. you don't want it to. Yeah. And because their delivery may not always be perfect. But the thing is to say, well, what do you mean when you say that? You know, talk it out so it doesn't fester inside of you as well. Also, a good resource is Joe's great book. God, <laughs> you don't find a great marriage. You build. One. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so you might want to check that out uh, as well. You can check it out at jamesd.com. Be, be slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to wrath. There's, yes. It's all in the Bible. God said how to do it. Well, I married an idiot. No, you married your opposite. And do you know the Bible talks more about your tongue than it does Jesus? That's right. About controlling yes. your tongue. So. Or hell comes from your mouth. Yes, it does. I get so much hell in my life. You open your mouth too much. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> Oh, that's a whole seminar right there. That's great. <laughs> yeah, years ago, I had a friend. He's a pastor now. And he loves to talk, and he is great, great preacher, and he's full of wisdom. But one day, I was trying to tell him something, so finally I just said, hey, could you shut your Bible? <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, that was 20 years ago, every time I see him, he said, oh, do I need to shut my pie hole? <laughs> Sometimes you do. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, here's our next question, Joe. Is there some kind of a guideline on how long a Christian is supposed to pray or read the Bible. It sure would be simple if there was. <laughs> no, no, there's not. And the people say, well, how long do you pray? I said, until something happens. Mm. How long? Well, well, I pray nothing happens. Then you need to pray longer. You know, uh, some prayers, are, they answered real quick. Uh, I've had times I've spent three years praying on something before it came to pass. Mm. Uh, but I think, I think, I mean, to me, the question means like how long a day like, like, in, but, I tell, well, the, to give you just a standard, you know, people say, well, right. you can spend an hour or you give God 10%, give him two and a half hours. No, 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 no. You don't need to do that. And I never did that. Even when I was a, as a parent, uh, we would go to school every morning and it was a 31 mile drive. So every morning people said, do you have family devotions? I said, no, we never had time for family devotions. But went to church every time the doors were open and we volunteered and we served, mm-hmm. and, uh, did mission trips and all that. So, but, no, you got to have the daily thing. So I carried a one year Bible. I still use a one year Bible. It's wore out right now. I wear out about one a year. Uh, New Living Translation, paperback, and uh, it's got it already marked off. Here's your reading for the day. You know, uh, you know, got something out of the Old Testament, something out of the New Testament, and the Psalm and the Proverb. And uh, so I tell people, you know, we drive to school, and so uh, we'd pull out of the driveway and about a mile and seven tenths to the highway, driving down a dirt road. And once we hit the highway, it's okay. I'd ask the kids what day is, and somebody said, well, you know, it's. You know, whatever it was, October the 12th, that's okay. You know, October 12th in the book, open it up and read the first three verses. And I'd make the kids read. Sometimes they were happy, sometimes they weren't. The point was, every day, every day. Now, I had I had six kids in the, in the back of that suburban. Some were happy, some were mad, some were ready to go to school, some weren't ready, some had done their homework, some had. I've got a zoo back there. But I needed to let them know every day we're going to read the Bible on the way to school. Mm-hmm. We got a, we got about a thirty minute drive. Read three verses. Throw the Bible. Hit your sister with if you have to. But then you read the next three verses. The point was every day read something. Uh, the Holy Spirit cannot remind you what God said if you haven't read what God said. God doesn't cheat. Mm-hmm. God cannot remind you what you've not read. Mm-hmm. God said my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What's knowledge? You got to get into it. So I tell people get your one year Bible and just uh, read the thing every day. And you can do it. The one year Bible. What they do at the most at the most it may take you fifteen minutes. And so if you just start your day, you, and once you get here's here's what I'm trying to tell people. If you read that Bible just for 10 or 15 minutes, then you can pray. Mm-hmm. You, you know, read. Now you got to drive. You can't read when you're driving, so drive to work. I don't care if it's five minutes or 50 minutes. On the way, there'll be enough scripture. Like, hey, God, that's interesting. You know, I need you. You know, make my family one together like, like you and Jesus are one. Hey, Father, you need to renew our hope in Jesus' name. And you'll start praying. Spe- you don't pray for religious reasons. You pray specific. Well, you know, I come from a background that you can get really under condemnation mm. and become it can become a works thing. I remember 
years ago, I was in my 20s, and the book, Could You Not Tarry One Hour, came out. And the big trend in the church was everybody get up at like five or six and go to church and pray for an hour. And I'm not a morning person. (laughs) (laughs) So I went one time, and I prayed and uh, fell asleep, to be honest with you, back in. in, And so we get in the car, and we're driving away, and my husband at the time said, how was that? Wasn't that great? Did you tarry for an hour? And I go, no, I didn't tarry for two minutes. <laughs> so you can get under condemnation with, with that. And those are man's, man's things. Here's the thing that helps me is when I remind myself that God created us to fellowship with him, yes, to spend time with him. And so then you go at it from that, a relational point of view. Then it is not a chore or something that is you got to mark off the checklist. Not legalistic. Yeah, it becomes something that you want to do. You want to have fellowship with him. Just talk to him. Talk to him when you're driving down the road. Talk to him when you're doing yard yeah, work. You don't have to bow your heads and close your eyes. The yeah. mama said, watch and pray. Watch yeah. and pray. So, And honestly, if you can, what do you say? If you can just read one Proverbs a day, yeah. get it in your heart. You know, let it dwell in your your spirit for a week. Let God speak to you. You know, uh, the the Bible says uh, the satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, yeah. but to the hungry man, every bitter thing is sweet. Yeah. And so that means if you just concentrated on John three sixteen, yep. and you're hungry, it'll speak something to you every time. Every time. But if you're just like, Ugh, you know, or you if you find yourself being critical. You know, if somebody oh, yeah. and if you got words. that one year Bible and you turn the page, oh, there's still two more pages. Yeah. I got to read two more pages of the Word of God. Oh, I'm already late and I'm mad. And you, and <laughs> and you might you might be satisfied. You want to try to say, God, help me with my just like that guy said to help me with my unbelief. Help me with my hunger. Yeah. You know, get my attitude right. But anyway. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. We love our Mailbag Mondays. We love that you take time out of your busy schedule to listen to us. That is very, very special to us. We are honored, very honored. Yes, thank you, partners, for making this possible. God bless you. And please, if you have any questions or you want more information, join us at joemcgee.com. We love you. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for listening today. Be sure to join us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to hear more of what God can do in your life. He's got a great future for you and your family, and we are here to help you get there. Make sure and go to our website, joemcgeeministries.com. We've got all sorts of materials, books, DVDs, you name it, all there to help you, your marriage, and your family succeed.